Hello. Uh, in, in this webinar, we'll explain how CAS removes common vulnerabilities in multi-factor authentication, how CAS serves the need for user ownership and control of identity assurance in cloud and mobile deployments, and how it integrates and enhances WSO2 identity server. Welcome all. I'm Basil Phillips, and my company, Distributed Management Systems, has invented and developed a radical way to authenticate users. I'm delighted to be joined by my co-presenter today, Denali Dabarera. Denali is a senior software engineer at WSO2 with formidable expertise in identity and access management technologies. These alarming statistics show that the number of data breaches continue to increase. There are many reasons. We think these are the most important. The good news is that we can prevent inherent vulnerabilities in current authentication methods, and we can make it very difficult for users to make the repudiation of disclosure defense. I have been innocently and unknowingly compromised. The most popular two-factor authentication currently used are out-of-band methods, like SMS and email. But these are weak, as German customers of O2 found out when their bank accounts were emptied. You can, uh, if you know where to go, um, buy products to intercept SMS messages. But the fact of the matter is that there is an inherent vulnerability with existing MFA products in that they all rely on fixed secrets. This could be an embedded key that the manufacturer inserts in a one-off password generator, or the private key that attests the credibility of a FIDO2 type dongle. If found out by discovery or by quantum factorization, or more likely by disclosure from a corrupt privilege insider, the security is bust. Fashionable software-only solutions, such as applying machine learning to define user profiles and thereby deny access on exceptions, have some logical intrinsic flaws. The most privileged users tend to need the most permissive usage, so they become the easiest targets. And you have to have an administrative team standing by on call to handle legitimate exceptions. And by the way, how are these administrators policed? Because their profiles allow them to change anything. The US Standard Institute of Technology, uh, Standards and Technology, NIST, as it's commonly known, mandates that software-only authentications cannot by themselves fulfill the requirements of the highest assurance level. CAS easily fulfills level three, which is the highest. Now, the obvious solution for this inherent vulnerability is to keep changing the secret. But this is not easy to implement. And here are some of the reasons why there are some fundamental pitfalls. For example, what if the change isn't acknowledged? Has the key changed or not? What if an outage occurs in transit of the commands? How do you immediately recover? What if a, a threat actor records the change instruction and interposes to replay at a future date, thereby unsyncing and denying service? We have developed a challenge response protocol that overcomes these difficulties, uh, but this challenge uh, uh, response protocol relies on the user needing a secure hardware chip to uh, compute 
the relevant response. The advantages of this challenge response protocol is that we can do dynamic key change in real time. What this means is that there is nothing for a hacker to target because there's no fixed secret, there's no fixed key. And there's nothing for a, a, a corrupt insider to disclose to a collaborator so that the collaborator can exploit the system. As you can imagine, this wasn't very easy to do. It required four inventions, and one of which has granted US and EU patents. So the granted patent is called uh, a scalable authentication system. And if you Google that, you'll be able to actually download the patent and see the methodology um, uh, writ large. Moreover, our product suite is certified by part of GCHQ, the UK NCSC uh, Cyber Authority, as being suitable for secret. It's in a, a field of one. And um, again, if you uh, access NCSC site and put cask in, you'll see the uh, description of uh, the functionality. Now, the token has many uh, manifestations. Uh, each of them contain an EAL6 um, ranked secure chip. The most flexible and the most currently used is the contactless secure smart card. Now, this looks and feels like a smart card and uses NFC for contactless working, but inside there is a, a very secure EAL level chip that has lots of protection in there. Any tampering with the card uh, results in a, an interrupt and we trap those interrupts. And if it's a severe interrupt, we can actually decide to commit suicide and wipe uh, some of the EEPROM wrong, uh, wipe the EEPROM contents. Uh, note uh, that we can actually cope with clientless uh, uh, settings. So for enterprises that have locked down clients, CAS still works. Now, the business case relies on what is the current trend. And the current trend in most enterprises concerns the transforming of legacy IT systems to cloud deployments, especially cloud deployments that enable mobile access. Now, pertinent and obvious questions to ask in this digital transformation process are, um, how are the administrators of the cloud deployment controlled? Do they use authentication products that have inherent vulnerabilities? It's always useful to point out the small print in cloud providers management service contracts about who actually is liable for any data loss. Uh, those small prints are very revealing. They usually state that the management service provider is never responsible uh, or liable for any data loss that occurs, even if it occurs within their own personnel. One of the ways that we can ameliorate this risk is that we offer a source code escrow, escrow facility. So users not only have the, the software licenses to run on uh, the CASC authentication server on their own servers, but ultimately have access to the um, code itself if uh, required and if subject to the contract of ESCO that we've agreed. Some other questions that are relevant in this digital transformation process is um, pretty operationally fundamental questions. Like if you move to a new cloud provider, how do you have to reinstate the identity provision? With CASC and WSO2, you don't. 
Other questions are for uh, a fundamental consideration are who generates and can you uh, and can read your own keys? With Cask, only the user generates uh, the keys and controls the keys. So we as a manufacturer or our delivery partner is never part of the risk. If a token is lost, can it be instantly suspended? With Fido 2 and Google Titan, they have no association with users, so lost devices still work. Are tokens able to be securely and easily redeployed for different users and systems? The idea of having a pool is very useful, but if it's a fixed secure ID token, it's not really a pool device. Note um, the pitfalls that self-enrollment capabilities uh, involve um, because invariably they increase the potential of fraud and uh, for disclosure. This also sounds fairly fundamental, but enterprises doing digital transformation need to ask the question, what are they trying to protect? What is the valuable set of data that the enterprise uh, treasures and needs to uh, protect? And this could vary uh, enormously between enterprises. For example, in pharmaceuticals, it might just be the current drug development and trials because published drugs are either, pay are either in patent or out of patent. And what they're really paranoid about is what their current uh, program of drug development concerns and the trials, and they don't want competitors to have access to that. So in, the, in this case, the, it's fairly easy to specify what the crown jewels are, and it's fairly obvious that you need to protect those with the highest and most robust security method possible, which we claim is CASC. But by protecting the crown jewels, you immediately de-risk the entire enterprise. The reality is for users, most users tend to have a common set of client devices that they use at home, at work, on the move. So the devices could be mobile, laptop, desktop, and these could have different operating systems, Android, Windows, Linux. So with Cask, we can actually provide a universal solution by delivering either the challenge directly to the mobile, when the mobile is the client, or displaying it as a QR coded image with the mobile acting as a surrogate reader. So um, I hope to uh, show you a little movie of the user experience um, when uh, this surrogate uh, reader, or having the mobile being used as a surrogate reader is, is, is used. So we'll just um, uh, try running this um, little uh, mobile. So uh, what what we're going to do is the user is going to firstly try and get on the the system uh, by putting in uh, her credentials. So here she goes. So the usual sort of credentials, and then follows the CAS challenge. So we provide a. Uh, uh, a non-crypto application, uh, a little app that allows uh, the mobile to read the challenge, which is presented as a QR coded image. And we use NFC uh, with the token to uh, transmit what the de desired response is. And if it's correct, um, the the user is let in. So that, that is a very easy way of, of processing um, and it could be on any uh, uh, client that the user wants to, to have. And of course, we could make provision for other uh, checks um, in terms of our interface with gateways on the health of the client. So um, what we see here is a schematic of um, CASC and WSO2. So what this um, shows is that an enterprise might have typically multiple deployments of cloud uh, enterprise apps 
on both cloud platforms or on-premise platforms or combinations of both. Uh, clearly, the, the dominant players in this field for cloud provision are AWS, Azure, and Google. Fortunately, all of them have a capability of using OpenID Connect protocol. So in this uh, implementation, we have WSO2 Identity Server acting as the independent identity provider, and prescribed users are trapped and referred to CASC for um, uh, multi-factor authentication. And this is done through the browser. So uh, we have a referral to WSO2. CASC is connected intimately with WSO2, and Denali will show how that architecture works shortly. And when CAS takes over, it will then do the challenge response interrogation. And if that's successful or, fa or failed, the result will be passed back to WSO2. WSO2 can then uh, return back to the source or the relying party and also add authorization uh, profile details uh, to the um, uh, playback uh, to the relying source. Now, here's a a generalized solution with the user control uh, controlling the identity provision. So it doesn't matter where your um, cloud apps happen to be, you have a, a central user controlled identity and access management provision that's independent of the particular deployment platforms that you use and therefore lends flexibility if in the enterprise world you want to change, you want to add, or more specifically, if you want to introduce supply chain to collaborate on particular shared uh, cloud servers, the CAS WSO2 connection makes this very easy to do uh, because you're in control of the, the uh, population of tokens, you're in control of its their deployment, and you're in control of the provisioning to users. So, uh, in summary, um, we, i.e., CAS plus WSO2, can reduce the overall risks to the enterprise in the most economic way. We don't interfere with any existing security services, we add to it. So, um, uh, now um, I'm delighted to um, hand over to Denali, who will tell you more about the integration framework of the CAS connector to WSO2 Identity Server. Thank you, Basil. So uh, before starting on the implementation, so let me first introduce WSO2 Identity Server which is the only open source IAM product that's uniquely ex extensible and optimized for identity federation and single sign-on along with adaptive authentication and API security. Furthermore, the identity server provides a federated identity management ecosystem which secures access to web mobile applications and endpoints in on-premise and cloud applications. Unlike other IAM vendors, our core and other extensions are open and freely available under commercial-friendly Apache 2 license. Identity server, server capabilities. Overall, WSO2 Identity Server is an identity and access management system with a lot of different capabilities. Out of these, Identity Federation and Single Sign-On are a couple of most popular features. Among IAM users and customers, we have more than 50 plus federated IDP support by default, and we have a capability of writing your own authenticators as well. 
WSO2 Identity Server is also considered as a platform that's used for identity bridging, where we can interconnect two platforms via provisioning and federation. We also support strong authentications like adaptive authentication and multi-factor authentication. We can also manage user accounts and user information centrally, and we can control the access of users to different applications using rules and policies. We do support different types of APIs and microservices which provide security for your applications. Furthermore, we manage privacy of users. We are concerned management, a privacy toolkit, and we do maintain IS analytics for anomaly logins. Let's look at key benefits of identity server. Why consider WSO2 identity server as your vendor? That's because we are fully open source and you can freely download the enterprise version that can be used freely. We have a wide identity ecosystem where we can plug easily into any infrastructure, any system with minimum facilities in infrastructure level. We have more than 40 plus extension points where you can extend your endpoints and write your own authenticators connectors if needed according to your user case. In fact, CASP SNR is one of the connectors that can be integrated with WSO2 Identity Server, and which is the focus of this webinar. CASP SNR connector is a local authenticator, which can be easily found in our WSO2 store, and you can download it and use it as a strong authentication step in the multi-factor authentication flow. If you have a CASC server available, you can freely download this connector and its artifacts from the connector store and configure it with WC2 identity server. And this process is really easy and understandable. Once you configure it, you are ready to use the CASC connector. So as far as I told, identity server has a lot of extensions points. So from the local authenticators, CAS connector is connected to the CAS server where you can use to log into any application. Let's, I will show you we are a demo. So the scenario what I'm going to show you is we are trying to log in to the WC2 API manager store where you have store of a lot of APIs. We are the CASC SNR connector as a second step in your authentication flow. So in this scenario, you will get first the login page where you enter the username and password. Then you will get a page to enter your CASC SNR secret, which is a dynamically creating secret. So let me show you this scenario with the configuration steps. So for this, what you have to do is first you have to find the CAS connector in the store. So you can just directly go to the CAS WSO2 store and find the CAS SNR connector. And for this, we have the connector, which is a JAR file. And we do have some artifacts, which is a web file, uh, a set of web artifacts. So you can download both this connector and the artifacts by giving your email. So once you download this, you can go to the official documentation, which is in the same page, where it will be redirected to your to a GitHub documentation, which has all the instructions for the prerequisite and for the artifacts that need to be configured this task with your authentication flow. 
So once you downloaded this connector, you have to have an identity server where you can use these artifacts. So you can put this connector to the components droppings folder. And I here I have already inserted my connector into this droppings folder. And which is cast connector 1.0.0. And all the other artifacts should go to the repository deployment web apps. Server web apps. So here we, we can see we have to put the cask.wo file. And once you start this, these files, you can use it in your authentication flow. So in order to start a server, you have to uh, give the Java home. And once you provide the Java home, you can start it easily with this simple command. And when the server is started, we have to follow the next steps in the documentation. So uh, we have to follow the configuring steps in the identity server part. And the first part is there. So in this cask scenario, we have a secret, a randomly generated secret. So we have to configure a place where we can store this secret. So in identity server, we have set of claims where we can store attributes. So we are creating a new claim called cask SNR token. And we are mapping an attribute, uh, LDAP attribute or whatever the user store attribute to that particular uh, claim. And we are storing that secret there. So once the service started, we are going to do that. So you can log in with an admin user. And first, you have to create this claim, which is a WC2 claim. And so I, here I have created a claim called cask SNR token. So here you go. So we have this, uh, I, we are creating a new claim called identity slash cask SNR token. And we are mapping it is to an attribute called display name which is not used by any other functionality of your identity server. And we, we do have to uh, have a regex for that, which is uh, bind to this cask server. So as I already have a claim called display name, I'm just uh, updating that claim as well with the same uh, regex. So you can use uh, any attribute which is not used by any other claim so that both uh, so that that particular claim will store only this cascade in our secret uh, so that depends on your requirement so once you do do that so the the, the next thing that you have to do is like you have to update this particular claim of all the users in your system. So right now, uh, I have two users called Cask1 and Cask2. So I'm going to update the profile with this secret. So in order to get, generate this secret, Cask, so Cask has a tool for this purpose. So we are using that tool and generate our own secret. And right now, my secret is this. and you can update your secret, the users, all the users' secrets, so that 
this user is capable of doing this cask SNR. So once you update it, you are good to go. And so in order to like log in, in order to have this flow, you have to register a service provider. So right now I'm registering my store and publisher as two service providers. And once I register it, so what I'm going to do is like, so I have to like uh, update the local and outbound authentication configurations where this is the place where you provide the multi-factor authentication. So here right now, my scenario is doing basic authentication plus cask authentication. So as the first step, I'm giving the basic authentication. And as the second step, I'm selecting cask auth where this application will provide cask UI as the second step. So once we done all these three steps, we are good to go with cask flow. So right now I have cask server running in my back, back end and I'm trying to log into my publisher, which is running on 9445. I'm, I'm going to log into store, which is running on 9445. And then I will be redirected to IS, which is in 9443. I'm entering my username and password. And then I will be going to the cask. So once you get this window, you have to have a card and the mobile app. You will scan first. Then you're scanning the QR again. Then again, you have to touch the card. So once you do this, you will get a secret, which is randomly updating each time. So once you successfully enter your secret to this page, you will be successfully logging to the pub, to this store without an issue. So this is how we can like use Cast Connector with WSO2 Identity Server and have a secured authentication flow. So that's it for the today's webinar. And if you have any questions, you can ask now. So, uh, so we have, uh, so we can create groups of users in WSO2 Identity Server. So, so these groups means particular set of users with uh, similar roles. So that way we can like create set of groups. So when we uh, go to the Spring uh, Scheme specification, the roles are called as groups, so we, we only have that phenomenon. So uh, I think Basil can like ask this question, uh, answer this question, where does the CAS server normally resides? Right, so we provide um, a virtual software licenses so um, those virtual software licenses are either uh, windows uh, server licenses or windows workstation licenses or linux licenses you decide what you want to use and we provide those virtual server licenses so you then deploy them on either on on premises which has got access to the cloud or or put them on a a server that you have um able to create in your your cloud um providers setting um so that's that's how uh, you get the 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 software additionally what we supply is a set of tokens as i mentioned the most popular is contactless smart cards so you tell us how many of these you need we then uh, provide them to you and we provide you with uh, a software uh, standalone uh, program to enable you to initially populate 
those tokens. So importantly, we as a manufacturer never uh, do anything with the tokens. You, you effectively get blank tokens. So you have to use your own um, random uh, to populate those tokens initially. And then you provide the initial starting profiles to the Cask authentication server. So that means that you are in control. So nobody else uh, has generated those uh, keys. Nobody else has got access to them. And you keep this standalone uh, software program, which we call the standalone administrator system, in, in a secure uh, lockdown place. So then away you go. You, you, you have um, admin features in the Cask authentication server, which allows you to allocate these to users, as you saw um, uh, Denali specify each um, uh, identity uh, of the smart card token and allocate them to a particular user. So there is a, uh, a requirement for the administrator to go into the CAS server, be authenticated and do those allocations. So a particular uh, smart card gets allocated to a particular user from to period and that and we also enable a whole set of different uh, administrator levels so that they can do various functions so for example at one level they could do suspense um so if a, re a, a, a user reports a lost token they can immediately suspend them um and then a higher administrator can unsuspend them and a higher other administrator can do allocations or deal allocations Hope that answers the question. Um, so the other question is, Basil, uh, so whether they wanted to host and manage their services. Uh, I think it's yes. So they have to host this Cask server and they have to manage themselves. Correct. It's, it's, it, the, they have control and ownership of the, of the virtual um, software license and uh, the full uh, way in which that's administered is all all included in that server license and uh, their documentation. So it's fairly all all of these things are fairly straightforward operational practice. And the other question is: Does Jordan server support creating and making checker workflow? Yes, we do. So we do have a BPN engine inside, so where you can have workflows in in all your systems so we do support that Um, so I think we have some questions. We have a few more questions. So you can like ask us any question if you have. Can CASC work on demand basis? Basil, would you like to answer this question? Uh, sorry, um, uh, could you just explain what you mean by on-demand basis? Um, so, like uh, only when the risk of a user authentication may be high? Like yeah, yeah, that, that's precisely the sort of ethos that we have. So you can define uh, users uh, and groups, uh, as Denali was indicating, or realms, where users accessing, for example, a particular server or a particular application that's sensitive, or a particular server that contains um, uh, the crown jewel data, they would then need to be authenticated by CASC. So the others that are accessing 
uh, <laughs> less restricted data will, will, will could be um, authenticated by other methods, but the ones going for crucial apps or crucial data stores could be um, delineated to be CASC authenticated. That's precisely the ethos we have in mind. Um, yes, by adding to this, adding some more to this. So in IWC2 identity server, we do have something called adaptive authentication. So if you feel like some users are in high risk, what we can do is we can provide like CASC authentication only for that particular set of users, and we can provide less authentication for the other users. So we, we, we can follow that option with adaptive authentication in WC2 identity server. We have that feature. So, uh, yes. So the other question is the difference between the API manager and WC2 identity server. So API manager is designed basically to manage APIs. So it doesn't manage users or users authentication. So for that purpose, identity server comes to the picture. So what identity server does is managing all the identity and access for a particular system that can be API manager as well. So yeah. API manager does not have those features, uh, which is in a uh, identity server, which is, so API manager is used only to manage APIs and store APIs. So when it comes to authentication, authorization, and other uh, adaptive authentication stuff, uh, the identity server comes to the picture. Yeah, and just as a, an add-on, um, for example, with the API admin manager, you could easily set up CAS to just authenticate the administrative role for the API manager. That would be a good application. Um, so, uh, so seems like uh, the questions are over. So I think like. We can wind up this session. Okay. Well, many thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, many thanks. Thank you all.